so much. I'm really glad to see so many, uh, I was going to say so many faces, but for the most part, it's so many names uh, <laughs> in the audience, uh, little black boxes. Thank you so much for sharing this evening. It's going to be uh, a real celebration of, uh, of not only of Calgary writing, but also of, of uh, Helen's fabulous, fabulous new book. So uh, buckle up. We have uh, about an hour and 15 minutes or so of, of readings. We'll have a Q&A at the end. So save your questions. I'm going to ask you at that point to put them in the chat come the end of the reading. And uh, we'll make our authors available to uh, engage with you at that point. It's a real honor to be hosting. Uh, we have three people on the bill. Uh, three and a half. Well, you know, four. Uh, so we're going to start with Wayne Chan, then Natalie Simpson. Then uh, uh, Helen will be reading from her new book, uh, joined by Ian Sam. And then a Q&A. So um, once again, my name is Derek Beaulieu. I'm the uh, host tonight, and I'm joining you uh, from Banff. I live uh, here on the side of Sleeping Buffalo Mountain in Banff National Park. And uh, to, to uh, build on what uh, we've already heard, uh, long as space for gathering and exchange, Sleeping Buffalo is located within Treaty 7 on the traditional territories of the Siksika, the Pekinese, and the Kainai, the Tsutsina Nation, and the Nakoda Nations. And it also uh, territory, territory is home uh, to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3 and our neighbors uh, in British Columbia as well. Our first reader this evening, and each of our uh, first two readers will be reading for about 15 minutes each. Our first reader is Wayman Chan. Wayman Chan continues to explore themes of dislocation and belonging in his poetry by drawing on biography, myth, science, and the everyday. His forthcoming book of poetry, which we're all very excited about, is entitled Witness Back at Me, Mismothering and Transmigration, Poems, and continues to investigate love interrupted. In his previous book, Human Tissue, a primer for not knowing, the object of love loss was an out of control societal trigger modeled on Dr. Frankenstein's abandoned monster. In this latest book, Chan draws on the childhood loss of his mother to breast cancer as a survival mechanism towards an aesthetics of disembodiment haunted by a search for nurturing. Mm. His work has been shortlisted for the Relit Award, the W.O. Mitchell Prize, and the Governor General's Award. And to start us off this evening, please help me welcome Wayman Chan. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for um, this lovely event, and as well to celebrate uh, Helen's latest book of poetry. Um, I'm certainly excited to see what Helen has cooked up in her work, as well as Natalie's. And yes, so uh, that um, early introduction is kind of like where uh, this manuscript's at. And um, just, sorry, <laughs> phone call. So I'm just gonna dive right into it um, uh, and just read some excerpts from this manuscript. So this one is called Defunding My Feely Map. Here in the basement of my workplace, there is no body to be without. My machine cools itself down, peering at model systems spread into fate magnified by nuclei. Many glimpses glimpsed in time, summer's brief breath dropped me into being. The tight-lipped cosmos fled and left Roy G. Biv to paint fits and solaces on my feet that merged pronouns from my electron microscope's sweaty lactation such that not one canoe of grief sailed past me today. The Lanthanide series overwrote the industrial scene, male, female, dissolution, my birth lottery seeing this hole filled with you. Science is missing its calluses and my mother can't hear me now that we're quiz master to our own Jeopardy episode. Six feet under wild tumors she couldn't, she couldn't control. Fall snaps its eyelids shut and looking back is weak. One poem's nocturne tutors, omniverse wings, so easy to oil the angel winged exoneration. I killed mom to leapfrog the child's incense, increasing peach and fessenjun, mimosa and wish sores, melting my shoes in meddlesome weather. 
With no wagon to burn on cleansed land, I grew a full Western beer gut, ignoring the ceremony of denial that my cousin, the anti-vaxxer mind control chip implanter, have I left anything out conspiratorialist, said, made us horny when we bunk up as kids and rub each other with monosyllables, like when ball pain confuses inside my head with nails. With no wagon to burn on cleansed land, a body will fill holes with more holes, somersaulted at the horizon of a hospital where you last saw her impregnating the prom you did not set out, staying home holding a slipper she used to wear. It was this way one stays home to realize what's truly stardust and golden. Proprioception. Herds killed and lands rethunk. You might not get out. The foster home stole your voice. You didn't exist for two years, but flew towards some tick of God's prototype in mom's tumor, prison break. Hong Shut on skates means slicing snow. She'd streak by in my dreams. Moi Meng Bak channels a moon white amnesia that suckled Nietzsche when your foster imposter swam dragged you through a stream, you gulped gill water. Goodbye, Anon, Barth, Barnum, Barcelona, pathetic angels burbling Tian Ming processionals where lucky red rhymes with home, the homologue of which means to be with. Angstrom Wiley spikes at Chongiko. From here you are to that irreducible gap, you cried, alveo, alveolio, too, hypo too hypoxic to get out. You're that bored peach, relaundered like a broken treaty. Uh, this poem is called This Word Mother and Its Second Life. If my decoy rises out of the word mother and walks from the room, the verb mother also loosens my tongue. I say the word and am synced to it. Let me not look back on my celial ferment from my blood to be her transference. Shouldn't I be convinced that she is me? Such love loss can share the same selfie. Descartes' ego, thinking equals being, owed to lilacs, Lee C, hell money, bargain tentacles, Shouldn't Kafka sneer or cower at me, a dork with inkstone and brush with benthic droughts owed? Phrases, de ou, which means owing lots, or ou de, which means thank you, renumerating earth to mother over mom. Some kids are cold to their queen, having been raised by nannies. I am cold to my mom, having been raised by death. Some Chinese families cried, mami ah, a colossus of closeness, but not us. I used to picture her as a child in Hang Ha, pulling fun si, which is yams, from the field and bending them at the knee like precious dolls. I'd hope that mother would take me home as wing ends of a bridge collapse when you slapped my face like a rubber decoy because I invited you to jump back inside. This word mother, when I said it out loud, knocked workaday mom off her milk stool. My obesant face stuck to mustard greens. Were you ever enough to believe in? she asked, who was now on her own. Mom kicked off her slippers and she extinguished me. This poem's called, The Son Speaks to His Childhood. And so uh, what I'm trying to kind of um, work on in this, in this um, uh, book of poetry is kind of like the reason why um, one dissociates. And, and I know from experience that uh, there was a time when I could almost fly out of my own body and experience as uh, myself as different things. So um, in this poem, the son is speaking to my two and a half year old self. The, sp the son speaks to his childhood. Mired in the Brahmin folds of deep distance, I watched you cry. You cry easily for the kindness of strangers seems improvised and once removed. On the drive from Calgary to Airdrie, you kept pointing at my weak stabs behind low cloud. Barely three, your foster family explained to you, not your brother, that I had my PJs on. Night would soon arrive, convex and upturned on your skin. An occasional moo queried the farm. 
please don't over anglicize this family whose son would go on to abuse your brother. You were safe because Tim didn't want a boy who shit his pants all the time. Midsummer heat, position silent. You watched me cross the sky. There you stand for hours behind the garage, spruce shade dappling the dogs who would not come near. They knew your fondness for clenching anything fur. There's a tiny cup on the sill that catches. Morning light is the reason for breasts. Childhood, mushla mushi. Busy, busy body threes and fours. Count three fingers minus your head. Don't forget to bless Uncle Phil. Bless Auntie Jill, not Tim. Can Anglicans tell when one, when one prayer is missing? Without blinking, you tried to encompass me, a failed conjurer. You mistook my warmth as a means of atonement. I was only light. That had nothing, that I had nothing to give you. Wrenched from the moon's reflective cool, you grew up before my eyes. For a time, you forgot who I was, and I felt safe. I returned to bossing the sky. Night splits off the dying patina. Mutha Mutli will not occasion any sleep where a mother is driven off. Her cruel touch waters your dream, and now you wish on me again? From one considered form to another, you cling lead needlessly. If you clench your eyes, I'll manage to find a way in. At worst, I stand for all things visible. Dare to look away, swaddle your unicorn, stuff it with enough glass, grass that proves earth is not a jury of one. Let me be the one to dispel your make-believe. But even as I say this, you look away. Such scorn cheapens us. Uh, this one is called, uh, throughout the uh, manuscript, uh, there's the voice of, of uh, my dearly departed friend, Sharon Prue Turner, who appears um, and, and speaks in, in, uh, in, in certain ways to me. So this one is called Sharon Speaking as Gopher. And though we're all free, and you are an ally of a world removed from the wronged world, and the sky asks nothing of you when you see other nightmares on the sails rack, and then you shouldn't have to squint at any scale of wonder, my boy. If only you were free. Okay, and I'll close, I think, yes, this is the last poem. And this one is um, just a kind of um, one in a different tone. Um, it's called Post Contact Muffin Tray. A tailings pond stuck its aperture in me. Black lotions pickled my face extra. Enemy is an enmity. Doubt clogged the swans. A tailings pond sands bougie dumplings. A tailings pond for spring swats. I'm not comparing. My balls are haughty balls as nudes are to Western art. A tailings pond to prorogue dire warning. If two songbirds ever meet again, binds the sculptor to his sublime clairvoyance. Does comorbidity of the people for the people fit? A tailings pond to marry, a tailings pond to please swamp thing. Less lagoon than cunning, are two songbirds worth drowning? Such titled cubism. A tailings pond to uphold treaty whack-a-mole, a tailings pong herding burps in feedlots that not even Poundmaker could fathom. A tailings pond rotunder than cats, specifically spoiled rotten marbled tabbies. As far as the eye can see, stepmum's fur-free scowl strikes the glass, swallowing boulevards in strawberry fire. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wayman. And thank you for honoring uh, Sharon Crutuni in her poem as well. It means a lot. A reminder, um, all of the books that we're here to celebrate uh, this evening are available directly through uh, Shelf Life. There is a link in the chat. Uh, we will keep posting that. There's the link. Uh, we'll keep uh, reposting that throughout the evening. Uh, feel free to uh, order the books, support the authors, support the bookstore so we can do more of events like this. Thank you again, Wayne. Our second reader this evening is Natalie Simpson. Natalie is the author of two books, Accrete or Crumble, uh, 2006, Line Books, and Thrum, Talon Books, 2014. 
Her poetry has appeared in several anthologies, including the best Canadian poetry in English and um, countless chapbooks, most recently Anonymous Widow, Anonymous Wife from the Blasted Tree last year. And her new uh, chapbook, Small Print, is forthcoming with Rob McLennan's Above Ground Press. Please help me welcome Natalie Simpson. Hello, thank you, Derek. Um, thank you, Derek, for the intro. Thank you, Wayman, for those wonderful poems. That was just lovely. Um, and I'm happy to be here today to help Helen launch her gorgeous looking new book. Um, Helen is such an admirable um, artist in so many genres in her writing and her visual art. It's all just so impressive. So I'm just honored to be here tonight. Um, and I'm going to start off with a poem called Catalog. Let's begin with claiming, tethering, trail spent, ludic. Let's claim beginning. Let shallow trenches crisply irrigate. Let flood sunder. I have antique talons adequately burnished. I have shocked form and illumination. Saw delicate truncheons, blockades, fumbling. Strip kindling, we furling went perpendicular. We have shaped erosion, stunted mudslides, roots stuck in escarpment, leaves littering space, a concrete mosaic, a molting testament. Each fingertip goads its other to triangulate space, each garrison tanks its conscience. All tokens we have surrendered, voluminous and haunting, each quarter, each doing, we timber our outcrops. We have boldly accosted our better instincts, staving flood to gush. I have calcified relenting, have tendered grace for storage, mainly spontaneous through indecision, I expire for hoping. I wrote a savor challenge, I verb and verb accretely. Mock flame dwindled, the sun caressed the hillsides pitting, the shock red flare, the air funneling in. We rocket false apparatus to wrap planets in drag tones. We line a flavor with high notes, spice outcomes, begin again. We write through clench. When I have tamed, I have feathered grateful. I have manned an exclusive boundary, my balconies border torque. My turbulent caution, I have taken an arduous lap. If I have shunned, I have filtered blatantly. If I have trammeled a path through wheat stalks, I have knowingly reversed. If I have tasted accomplice, I have also tailored rune. If I have ameliorated anyone, it's my own flippant conclusion. If I have rude, I have done so bountiful. I have jeweled and carpeted my solemn square. The brim flaunts surface tension, drips liquid and juices burr. Caution spools a plush humility, a capped sham. The pleasant nun, the grappling room, the blooming vein has spilt its ration. Um, so this next poem is not yet titled. My flight feathers dampening, my down sacked and plush. My innermost scrawl has scratched surface, ripped sharp, li sharp lines into engineered hardwood, striking in the sunsheen. Then suddenly winter and grace and plausible. Then suddenly false bottom and deepening warm core. Milliseconds tense shimmer, figuring distance into depth, turning cycles infinitesimally, slow encroachment, Cocked feathers, flight and gathering, a ruined fluency, a net tethering, flocked at the withers, leaping into soon, patterned by spots, contrasts, sham flight, layered by quills and history. Thin bled into river maps veined across the corpus, a deep mineral instinct shone weakly off the mist tilled a desolate introspection, flirting with the symmetry, the mysterious windows, the worn carpeted berth, flirting with traction and thimble space and the final moon. Uh, this is a slightly longer poem and it is called Wrapped Fractures. <clears throat> 
An ambulance pitch, fresh snow, the scene below, soft leaf peel, matte interior bursting inner mischief. Stems team to trunks, vernacular, strips of treed, a sleeve of hurtsters. We rain voluminous spurrings, thunderous governance, tamping the russet grid. We have purpled our being. The sun lingers voluption. Our longing confides in our reticence, gathering mourning, wrought firmly it skims the gentle manifest, spooling loop, a torn blue consequence, leaf light, a shadow vein, coming through thickets, through sadness, plain grass, ontogeny, tap actuals, coming through fervor, reluctance, taming. Place here fashion and hear the assault, Place here derision, shame and pickled insolence. Trace here succulence, our tender bones. Taste here craven, here malleable. Stem here brutal, looming, succinct. Ship symmetry, shape soothing. Here tailing, here tame ambience. Scale here reverence, institutional, dooming, tell scrim. We have whispered slope essentials, unwieldy spooling pockets of loss. The tense eruption of feeling into plastic, into the ecstatic real. Picture this then occurring, a strong spill of essence, a calm mask torturing home. The blessed fallacies pile, the wanton notions. Recuperate the falling star points, pox of light in the glossy spill. Suppose a railing outward, a tall, long, winnowing, Suppose an emotional segregation stamped out form, a flame infringing. Suppose a mollusk, hardened shell, grave wood musk. Suppose it crawls, circling fresh shoots, tense saturation, verbs quavering on branches, caught rain pooled in them. The gaunt blossoms bend, terrestrial and filtered. Suppose it coincides. Um, <clears throat> So I noticed that uh, Helen very kindly um, quoted my work at the beginning of her book, and she quoted from a poem in my first book, A Crete or Crumble. Um, so I thought I'd just revisit this, and it's been a while since <laughs> I've read from this book or even really looked at it. So it's um, a nice, I just thought I'd read a, a few pages just as a um, nostalgic remembrance of this book. Frequently held and self aloof and solve a frequency. That self is self, it doesn't bend. That main to skyward, main to lease, that this is an elucidation. Enduring, says, honor sadden, honor small. Make out of matter, merrily sudden, merrily some. Wishful, these forms force out. Strive to make use of all that speaks. Particulars fall as leaves fall. Artifacts hold space, skin held place, and always a simple speech, and always a final reduction. <clears throat> Seek and say it squarely. How would passion, strategy, and mounting as increase? Seek means definition makes a measure, means of passion reconciles. To speak in particles wasn't justify a world. Speak has distinction, speak it lays it out, find passion is steady, seek it speaks it out. Every horizon to a man, every solemn, always solemn, every sentence has a plan. Heart learns and quantity theories and quantity theories correct. The heart learns emotion, when didn't motion beat? The heart learns beating two by two by sizes, when the heart beats distinction out, when flash sounds temper, constant and temper attractions, heart beats to attraction, the heart is a fine weave. Um, so this next piece of writing is um, fairly new and it's, uh, if it doesn't sort of coalesce into a poem, I think it might be verging more towards a statement of poetics. Um, it's not yet titled either. I tell you now, it was not trembling. 
It was not the moon. It was no longer hunching. It trebled and quickened. It sat rendering. It came to the same courage. It amounted to the moon and a person behind the moon and the light that glanced off. It was no longer everything and it bailed on its necessities. I tell you, it was a ptarmigan that creatured and stopped. I tell you unfazed, I'm lying. I tell you no reasons and for no one. I'm not telling you this story, I'm not this now. I'm behind the moon, it's waning is my only tremble. It wobbles regularly off its axis because of me. You don't need to know anything about my nature or the world you notice. The words are enough, the silence is enough. The light glances off the moon or glass or any surface. The light is all it needs. The glass is all it wants to be. The moon has everything it can imagine. You don't need to keep describing it. You don't need to learn it anew. Keep crouching and keep branching and taste words. They have so many dimensions you haven't noticed before. They're trying to tell you how they work. Um, <clears throat> And I'm going to finish with a very short poem, one of my favorite little poems recently. Um, thank you again, Helen, and congratulations again. Turn eros into store, flaw into wolf, turn fallow to laughing, thought to plode, lope into implode, feel into elf, tether into wrath, cloud into dower, terse to rest, nothing into other, Final into limp, turn simple into bliss, limp to prim, turn into skint, bother to shod, caustic into tossed, suture into rest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie. It was, uh, it's always great to hear your work. Thank you so much. If we were gathering in person, and I appreciate that uh, we are still uh, keeping our distance and making sure that we, as a community, remain uh, safe and healthy. If we were meeting in person, now would be the time where we would take a brief break, where we would uh, all rush towards the uh, checkout desk to, to purchase all the copies before they, of the books uh, being celebrated tonight. And uh, instead, I'm going to um, recommend that you all once again, look in the chat, find the link that Shelf Life Books has provided for us. And while I tell, uh, while I tell a joke, you're all going to click on the, uh, on, the, on the buttons. And there it is again from Shelf Life Books to uh, purchase um, books by Natalie Wayman and of course, Helen's. So while you're doing that, a priest, a rabbit, and a minister walk into a bar. The bartender asks the rabbit, what will you have? The rabbit shakes his head and says, I have no idea. The only reason I'm here is because of autocorrect. So if you want something better than that, I strongly recommend the three books uh, that we're uh, celebrating this evening. I'm, and I, I'm used to my jokes not getting any response, just silence. So telling them over uh, over Zoom um, is is you know I'm getting about the, uh, the the sonic response I would expect. So now uh, <laughs> it was a good joke. You, that that's great. Uh, my daughter has just posted. You'd think after so many years of dad jokes, I'd be used to them. So I've heard that. Uh, same or, but <laughs> instead it's uh, the three walk into the bar and the rabbit says, hey, I think I'm a typo. But um, boom. Uh, so um, our headliner this evening, um, the book that we're here to celebrate uh, will be uh, performed by a duo. Uh, the first of the two is Ian Sampson. Ian Sampson is a poet and scholar. He owns it, uh, he ho oh, holds, excuse me, a PhD in English from Brown University, where he wrote a dissertation about constraint-based literature in the tradition of the Ulipo. A graduate of the University of Calgary's creative writing program, he has published work in the Calgary Renaissance, among other venues, and regularly performs as a sound poet, beatboxer, and improviser. Sometimes also a medievalist, he received the 2013 Boccaccio Afterlife Award for his rendition of the story from the Decameron, and is currently at work on a version 
Beowulf. He, uh, he lives in Victoria and will be joining on stage our headline. The star of the show uh, this evening is Helen Anutsky. Helen is the author of two previous, uh, uh, previous, previously uh, published and truly exceptional titles, Magyarazny, shortlisted for the uh, Stephen G. Stephenson Award for Poetry and Poets and Killers, A Life in Advertising, shortlisted for Exposine's English Book of the Year Award, and the chapbook Bloom and Martyr, winner of the John Lent Poetry Prose Award. Her work at the University of Calgary Press is bringing exceptional books into the world. She is the publisher of the fabulous Interrobang Press, Mom to a Mean Cat Betty, partner to a rock star David, and is a wonderful, wonderful friend. It was an honor to work with Helen, editing Frost and Pollen, and see how she formed, crisped, and grew the flowers and pruned the branches of her, of her new book, Frost and Pollen. She's here to launch her latest book. It's available in the chat, uh, new from Invisible Books. And please, Helen, Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to thank Shelf Life and Derek for the wonderful land acknowledgements and Shelf Life for being amazing. It's my favorite bookstore. So even if we're not there in person, it's so nice to be able to do this uh, with them and everyone at Invisible. So Lee, Julie, Andrew, and Megan, actually, yeah, Megan, I think, um, uh, who are all just the most wonderful people to work with on the book. And uh, that was sort of, I think it was accepted sort of right before the pandemic. So the whole thing, the whole process has been uh, through all of this. And um, it was really nice to have something, uh, yeah, so special happening during like such a otherwise stressful time. Uh, and I wanted to thank Derek for being such a wonderful editor. Um, and Wayman and Natalie, uh, who I admire so much. And Wayman, thank you. It was, uh, it was so moving. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to read your, your next book. Um, and uh, I want to thank Natalie, who also is like such an inspiration. In fact, uh, the first long poem in this book called Bloom and Martyr was really uh, inspired directly by her work. I think I, at the time I was living outside of Calgary and I came home for a visit and uh, saw Natalie Reed and I don't know, maybe I already had thrum or picked it up then, but I remember her talking about writing that she kind of like write out uh, a lot of sentences and then sort of edit them down and keep the good bits. And I thought like, yeah, I feel like I haven't written like that in a long time and I enjoy writing like that. So I read through them and it's like so rich and inspiring. So I read that and then wrote that poem. So they're kind of very, uh, yeah, directly inspired by Natalie's work. So thank you so much. And um, I also wanted to thank Ian Sampson who saved me from certain embarrassment among the uh, you know, large population of people who know how middle English rhymes work. Uh, <laughs> um, so he helped me uh, with that part of this poem. So uh, foliage, which we're going to read from today, is a retelling of the Arthurian legend Sir Gawain and the Green Knight from the point of view of the Green Knight. And originally, it was just 13 little um, sort of moody little poems and prose poems. And when I started working with Derek on the book, I said, you know, I don't want to, I think, you know, rewrite it just in the same form as the original. And yeah, I don't know. I thought, you know, it seems like a lot of work. Maybe I won't do that. And then Derek said, you know, you could include some of the, like the original dialogue of the Green Knight. And I thought, yeah, okay. And then as I started doing that, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to rewrite the whole thing in the form of the original. So I did that and I'm really, uh, I think it's really fun, I hope. Uh, so to thank Derek for the inspiration there. But in uh, the original poem, um, everyone at Camelot having a wonderful Christmas and all of a sudden a giant green knight walks in and challenges them to a Christmas game. Uh, no one wants to accept and eventually Gawain does sort of out of embarrassment uh, and I think a feeling of obligation once Arthur is like fine if you are all too afraid to do it all accept it you can't let the king do that so Gawain takes it up so the game is that uh, the green knight will let Gawain hack off his head and then in a year 
he'll return the blow. So Gowing's like, okay, we'll you'll be dead. So I guess that's fine. Um, so he chops off the Green Knight's head. The Green Knight picks up his head. Goes, okay, come find me at my chapel in here and rides off. So then Gowing has to go on an adventure trying to find him. And right before New Year, when he's sort of despairing that he'll ever be able to find the Green Knight, uh, he goes to a castle, uh, or he finds a castle and there live uh, Lord and Lady Bertilac. And they're like, oh, we know where the chapel is. No problem. Spend Christmas with us. And then we'll show. So, uh, and various exciting things ensue. I guess you'll have to buy the book uh, <laughs> to hear the ending. But uh, the original is sort of, uh, focused on the themes of honor and honesty and truthfulness and in rewriting it with the Green Knight as the main character and speaker it's more uh, than sort of a I guess eco-critical poem so imagining him as the defender of the woods in the context of climate change. So Ian was very helpfully uh, coaching me in my middle English because I want to be able to read this poem that'd be really fun read the middle English part and at a certain point he's like yeah you, you kind of sound like the like the Swedish chef from Muppets still and I'm like yeah <laughs> and it occurred to me like oh maybe wait we're doing this remotely it doesn't matter that Ian isn't here he can still join us and he can read so he very graciously uh accepted to read with me on very short notice so um we haven't had a chance to practice the switching on and off much, so. Uh, but I think, despite that, it's still better than my Swedish chef impression. So, we're gonna read the first section of uh, foliage. So, ah. <laughs> okay. When Hades had his fill of hurling flames and catapulting comets, the churning magma mellowed, smothering Earth's embers. Then in the Archean, the Earth's crust cooled into continents, and the original organisms stirred in the oceans, exhaling oxygen. Then in the Paleozoic, primordial plants populated Pangaea. Ordovician swamps were festooned with the spores of tiny shoots. And then in the Devonian, carbon dioxide doused Earth's dewy gardens. And at last, Archaeopteris ascended into the ancient atmosphere, wrenching its wooden roots into the sod and clod and clay breaking rocks and stones to nourish ponds and waterways. So trees shape this world with green and ease while regal ferns unfurled in splendid filigrees. Then when world wanted ornaments, Flora in her flowing robes gifted flowers to the leaves that flourished and fragranced the wind. With her every step, sweet spices sprang forth to flavor the fields. And then before her dance was done, she knelt down to the ground and placing her palm on the merry moss moving to the music. She conjured me to keep watch over the trees and ferns and flowers, the holy holly and blooming baubles that adorned her dominion, the roots and rot that sprout and feed the fauna that walk the earth. And so the boughs burgeoned and blossomed, flourished and failed. And I dozed, drowsed by the harmonies of life's rhythms. These isles were then disturbed by the arrival of men desecrating the forest with destruction so vile, until I awoke to restore tranquility when the woods called on me for my ax and for my guile. Stirred from my slumber in the sumptuous moss moist with snow, I awakened at Yuletide with the evergreens grown flush with frost and the ivy glistens and glittering garlands of cold crystals. My juniper beard studded with snowflakes and lichen, I rested the roots of my arms from the dirt my legs from the land, and standing full and viridescent, I straightened and stretched, and there, buried beside my bed in a blanket of botanical debris, was my axe, still grand and massive, but dulled by dulcet peace. Kneeling, I prized to the prize from the placid patch of plants and heaved this heavy honor high above my, high above my head. And so, to play fate's game, in my heart I know, I must seek Morgan Le Fay, the dame who can sharpen this blade of woe. Wandering the woods, I wend my way to the water, and behold at the place where the boughs bend open, a glade, glistening with a lagoon ringed by a granite beach. And there, in the tempest, a sorceress stands in a clearing of calm, 
where no wind can disturb her, no cold can cool her, and the ferns and flowers and fronds thrive in her spring. My soul is so satisfied by the sight of this enchantress. I lay my axe, my trough, my heart, my life at her charmed feet. And this bewitching beauty bends to take my hand and the handle, and leading me to the lagoon, she draws the axe across the stone. My blade, now sharp and true, I embrace my mate, my maid. She whispers her wit so shrewd of how we should stage our charade. I am the bite, the bitter brethren of the branches left to men's mercy. Tied to the earth, they cannot fight the foul forest mangling mortals who wreck the woodlands and demolish the meadows. Those vile villains who vex the venerable earth that privileged them, that gave them shade and shelter and sustenance and pleasure. Men who felled the forest to fuel their fires and fashion their turrets. And so my quest is to quell the cupidity of these cavaliers, to sow a seed of foreboding in their stomachs at their holiday feast. My gift will grow into a notion that will gnaw at their feeble wits, that if they abuse the abundance of Eden, the garden will strike back through me. I am the defender of the woods and trees and men's tormentor with tricks and mysteries. On my crusade to the castle, I collect my exuberance and buoyancy. I bow to each copse, my eyes crisp and crimson like holly berries, my kin, my kind, the twinkle of thickets and thorns spark in me notions of the particulars of the Christmas contest to challenge the cavalrymen of Camelot, who cut the flora down for their comfort. They chop and scorch and squander the bounty of the earth, confident the uncultivated acres will come blooming back. So the game on which they will gamble their gallantry and goodness will be twisted like a vine twining up the towers of their towns. And as I decide the details of how to deceive the dubious champions, I arrive at the chateau. And so, and to its gates I ride to see what I might bestow, to see what I might contrive. Battering their barricades and bursting their doors, I bash booming into their boisterous banquet. The silly aristocrat suddenly silent but for gasps. I shift my ax from hand to hand, so the blade and hilt glint in the glimmering glow of their gilded gala. All are breathless at my burly oaken brawn. Then, Bellowing in my best beastly bark, with withering weightiness, I wail. Where is the governor of this king? Gladly would say that Sejin sicht and with himself spake reason. The knights cower and the ladies swoon. To my terrifying power, no mortal is immune. Their mortifyingly meager monarch in man's manner entreats me to engage in their eating and enjoy their ease in this hall where the holly they hacked from its home hangs, this room where the woods they wounded burns to coal. The idea that I would enjoy this insulting auditorium makes me emerald with inflamed temper. These measly men whose mansion is ornamented with wilting boughs and imitation wrought iron wood, whose windows are wound with drawings of flowers, deign to think I dine at their dead table. This feast will soon come to an end, not in a sigh of peace, but with one condemned when my contest has ceased. The moment for my and Morgan's game nigh, I say, Nigh, as help me hither and here sitteth to warn any wheel and its worn, it wots not me end. But for their loss of fair ladies, lift up so here, and they burg, and they burn as best are holden, stiffest under stell grey on stairs to read the weakest and the worthiest of this world is keen the preve for to ply with an author poor lacus and here is kid a courtesy as he have heard carp and that hath wain at me here he wis at this time ye may be sicker be this branch that he bear a hair that he pass as in pace and no place such for had he founded in fair and fecht in wiese, he have a huberge at home and a helm a bothe, a sheld and a sharp spear, a shin and a bricht, and other weapons to wear a wain well als. But for he would no wear, may wear us are softer. But if thou be so bold as all a burnest telling, thou will grant me godly if a goman that he ask be rich. And their credulous king swears, whatever game might be my wish, a knight there will accept my dare, a fool whose honor I will squish. Guaranteed an engagement, I lay down the gauntlet. Nay, 
Freist ihn auf Ficht, in Faith in Terra, mit einem Boot on this bench, boot bearless Childer. If he were hasped in armes on a hier stere, here is no man made to match, for mich is so weich. For fee, he crave in his court the Christmas common, for it is yol, a new year, and here are yep money. If any so hard in his house hold as himself, and be so bold in his blood, brine in his head, that dar stiffly streak a stroke for another, he shall give him of me gift this gizene rich, this axe, that is heavy enough to handle as him likes, and he shall beat it the first burr as bar as he sit. If any freak be so fell to fond that he tell, lepe lichtly may to, and latch this weapon, he quit climb a hit forever, cape hit as his own, and he shall stand him a stroke stiff on his flat, as though will dicht me to dumb, to daily him an author barley, and yet if him respite, a twelve month and a die, now he and let it eat, dar any herin noch sei. I cast the crimson crystal of my eyes around the castle. None of these knights have the nerve to take up my challenge. My trick has tickled me and trashed their troughs in timidity. To spite these spineless soldiers, I ask. What is this Arthur's house? Drave Rus Renes of Thro Realmes so many? Where is new your circadria and your conquests, your grindelike and your grima and your great awardes? Nu is the revel in the renown of the round table, overwalt with a word of unwehous speech, for all dare is for dread without dint should. Shamefaced, they sit in silence, their court disgraced by the threat of violence, their holiday mirth debased. And Arthur, annoyed by his faint hearted allies, to halt the humiliation, says, He'll hack off my head. Then, at last, a lad lets his morals clobber his fearfulness. As Morgan anticipated, Sir Gawain approaches and asserts uh, to tell Arthur and to, sorry. <laughs> uh, Sir Gawain approaches and asserts to author, Arthur and all, oh my goodness, let's start again. <laughs> then at last, a lad lets his morals clobber his fearfulness. As Morgan anticipated, Sir Gawain approaches and asserts to Arthur and to all the aristocrats that he will heave my axe. I ask. Reforme, we are forwardes, ere we fair pass. First the aide they have, who that thou hattest, that thou may tell it truly as he trist my. In courtly form, the soldier identifies himself as Gawain. And the lad agrees, giving his guarantee, approving our pact. I heave the rules out like a thorny vine. Sir Gawain, so moti thrive as am fairly fine, this dint that thou shall drive. Begog, Sir Gawain, may likest that ye shall fang at the first that ye have phrased hair, and thou hadst readily rehearsed, be reasonful true. Clanly are they covenant that ye king ask. Saf that thou shall sicker me, said be thee truth, that thou shall set a me thy sylph where so thou hopest, he may be fund upon folly, and fought they such wagus as thou delest me to die before this do the richer. Before his brethren, the boy must bow, for he has held up his own hand to bear my scorn for man's evils. We'll see how he fares, burdened with this primeval bondage he now wears. His eyes betray his terror of, of entering the unknown, of the occult mastery of the ancient trees and thickets. He pleads to know the place of my chapel, and I say, That is enough in new year, it need us no more. If he tell thee truthfully, when he tap a have and though me smoothly hath smitten, smartly if they teach of me host and me home and me own nome, then may thou phrase me fair than forward this hold. And if he spend no speech, then spare us through the better. For though me lang in the land and light ni fair, both slokes, ta nu 
the grim metola today, and let's say who, and let's say who through Knokis. Gawain agrees and picks up the blade, my enchanted axe holding his focus. So the snare is set. And I will soon sow the lesson that hacking and harvesting the heart of the wild is tempting a tempest that no mortal can manage. That man's abominable acts against his habitat come with a consequence that he must contend with. I kneel and carefully comb my crown of verdant curls to expose my naked neck for the night to carve. A prisoner of our pact, the paladin picks up the ax, heaves it so hard it hacks into the ground, but to his horror, Without wincing, I wait for my head to halt its rolling. I glare at Gawain from my severed head and pick up my crown by the hair, watching his eyes blossom with dread as I grin with wild delight and declare, Loka, Gawain, so be grave to go as thou headest, and light as lere till thou may lure findeth. As thou hadst het in his hara herne his knichtes, to the green chapel thou chose. He charged thee to for such a doomed as thou hadst dealt. Deserved thou habest to be yearly yolden on no a year's morn. The knicht of the green chapel men know in my money, for they may for the find if thou phrased as fair as thou never. Therefore come, or the recreant be called as they behoves. My dangling head delivering this devastating dare, I mount my mighty steed of moss and leaves to ride swiftly back to the glen to recount to Morgan the tale of the night now aggrieved, left with a long year of dreadful days to count. I gallop to the glen where my gracious fay awaits, and she lovingly lays her mystical hands upon my laceration, and twigs begin to twine where, there, where blood had rushed. Healed and whole and happy, I hoist her heavenwards and lay her in the lush lee, where she plants a gen her gentle lips upon me, drawing with her forefinger a five-pointed pentacle, first upon my breast and then again on my belly. We embrace, entwined in the twisting gossamer grasses of our glade. We doze until dawn's dew settles in our drowsy mead and wake in the wonder that once our hoax is concluded, our child, will be born to bear the grudge of any wild land these men defile. She will serve as nature's judge upon whom the goddess Flora will smile. My formidable sorceress then commences conjuring, drawing with a jade dagger in the dirt, our five-pointed pentacle. And petitioning the planet's potency, she pulls up from the plane a captivating chapel of creeping vines and cascading orchids. From here, my power pulses like spring pumping in my veins. Next, my enchantress entreats a nearby glen to give her grace, to raise the ramparts of a radiant fortress from the dirt, and for the birds and beasts to appear as people, ladies and knights, until Gawain comes to contravene our covenant in his cowardice. Last, my lady transfigures me to a man and her form to a matron, and we wait until the unworthy knight has arrived to open the star cross gate, to step into the snare we have contrived. He approaches our prey tempted by our bait. That's it. That was just fabulous. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you, Ian, for being the, uh, the, the sinister voice. Thank you, Wayman and Natalie. For, for supporting this fantastic celebration. Thank you to uh, Shelf Life and Invisible, and to all of you for, for, for joining us this evening. I'd like to uh, open the floor uh, to any questions while people are also uh, checking out the link that uh, Shelf Life has provided to be able to order books this evening. Uh, if you have any questions for our authors, I uh, ask that you uh, put them in uh, the chat, type them out into the chat, and I will uh, read them out to the uh, well to our to our readers this evening. Um, while you're uh, thinking about uh, questions and ordering your books, I'll lob one Helen's one uh, Hel uh, one Helen's way. Um, what makes the Green Knight so urgent? 
in 2021? Why, why this story? Why now? And what drew you to this? Um, I guess I always, well, not always, but uh, since I was an undergrad, I always wanted to do something uh, creative related to uh, my medieval studies. Um, and I think there's there's something so appealing about this uh, tale for so many reasons. Like it's it's very peculiar and it's very sneaky. And I think a lot of it is also like it's, um, you know, Gawain seems very immediate and some of the things he does seem very relatable. And it also seems like very distant and evil at the same time. But I think for me, this um, idea of, like our relationship to nature is at such a like crucial point right now um and everything is so dire that it feels I, I i feel like maybe living in alberta um like we're experiencing some of the more aggressive uh like fallout from climate change now like sort of losing our summers to this like horrible smoke um and this like feeling of that relationship with nature being um out of balance but also of us suffering now because of it it's not sort of only the nature of things episodes from when I was a kid that are like could you you should probably do something now <laughs> like everything's dying you should probably do something now like now it's uh being done to us so I think that idea of the night as uh like embodying that um fallout was interesting to me I think too that the story on a on a lighter note, the story um, whenever it snows here and it's green, which happens very often in Calgary, um, it reminds me of this story uh, and these sort of scenes of them being out at Christmas and the snow on the on the green sort of boughs. So um, when I was thinking I would like to sum submit Bloom and Martyr uh, for publication, I thought, well, it's kind of too short to be a book on its own, so should beef it up with something else. So. <laughs> and it was like one of those beautiful days and I was listening to Simon Armitage's uh, translation of The Green Knight and I thought, you know, I really love this tale. I think I'd like to do something with that. So yeah, they're kind of the two. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. In the chat, um, uh, Christian Book has asked, not only um, as invisible, um, Asks, uh, he asks if Invisible has sent a copy to the producer and director of the new Green Knight movie. And uh, according to uh, your publisher, Lee Nash, uh, they are in fact on it. But uh, following that up, uh, have, has, have you responded to the merits of the movie? Has, uh, have you seen the film and did it impact the writing? It did not. And <laughs> it's funny because when there was an ad for it, I mean, I was like, Awesome, I'm finally part of the zeitgeist. What are the chances? <laughs> um, and we were gonna go see it in theaters and that's just when COVID numbers here started getting grim again. So we are like, oh, maybe not. And we've ordered it on Blu-ray and it arrived earlier this week. I'm like, I should watch it before the launch because probably someone will ask about it. <laughs> and then we didn't have a chance to, but I know Ian has seen it. So maybe he would wanna talk about it from like a medievalist -y point of view. Well, actually, we'll, we'll link that um, because there is a, a question for Ian as well. And that is um, building on what you did here this evening. How's your translation of Beowulf <laughs> coming along? Uh, and uh, any comments uh, that you would like to uh, connect uh, today's performance with, with the film? Um, yeah, to answer the first one, uh, it's going. It's a, it's a long poem and I've gotten about a quarter of the way through. Um, in what has it been 10 years, I think. So um, we'll see when that comes out. Ken is one of the few people, I think, who has actually seen, um, seen what has been written because nothing from that has been published. Uh, yeah, the, the film, I have seen the film, but um, I've, I've not thought carefully about it, its connection to, to Helen's work. Um, uh, one thing I, about the film, I think that is, was refreshing was it wasn't too Hollywoodized. It's still a very surreal, tale um, and very disjointed and plays with time and plays with, um, uh, uh, I guess, you know, tries to give, give modern uh, viewers a sense of, of what 
you know, a, a virtue of sort of knightly virtue, which is a hard concept, I guess, to grasp in a world where the, the kind of heroic ethos doesn't exist the way that it existed then. There's a missing context. And I think the film does that really well. And I think the book um, also um, uh, draws us into that world in a really, really compelling way. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, I think Helen can, you can watch the movie and, <laughs> and tell us all what you think. I'd be very curious to hear. Thank you, Ian. I encourage if anyone else has questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I am going to pick on somebody, however, and ask if David has any questions specifically for Helen and the writing of this book. David is either on mute or uh, struck mute. We're not sure which. Um, in the other room, I heard him go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So if you, um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, it would be great to hear from you. And while you do that, as I said, uh, the, the, the books are available through Shelf Life. Um, the, the publisher, Lee Nash, is also uh, in our virtual room here. And I'd like to celebrate uh, invisible and all the work that they're doing to publish exceptional books of poetry in Canada. It's it's really uh, wonderful to see how they're uh, supporting uh, so many um, so many writers and are really willing to take risk on you know, beautiful beautiful designs. Uh, so thank yeah. you, Lee. Really I, appreciate um, that. I sent there them just a, a few rambling words about. I'm like something with flowers, they're really cool, but like nice, but like creepy. And they came up with this beautiful thing, and I'm very grateful. Um, I had a question for Wayman actually. So, I guess, um, I'm just wondering what it's been like writing about your mom and grief. I guess I'm, I sort of thought of, um, like writing like that, it's you're kind of uh, dealing with this thing where it's like a very personal emotion, but then also kind of a shared one with like other family members or other people who know the person. So I was just wondering how you feel about that, like writing about grief when it's kind of this like personal, but also community experience. Um, one day at a time, <laughs> it changes. Um, um, the emotions um, that kind of go through um, each, each poem, um, they change from month to month, and and um, but it's a long project. It's a very long project. I mean, for me, it's a lifelong project. Yeah. Seeing how um, you know retrieve memories and how um, certain ways uh, of of dissociation um, have kind of cropped up throughout my life, and I'd never analyzed it before. But it was really interesting approaching it from almost like a personal archaeology point of view. And from that also I was extracting words and, and, and revisiting um, and remembering um, words from, from my childhood language, which is a dialect of Cantonese called Toy San. And so it was a very intimate kind of uh, slow discovery, which is why this book's been uh, in the pipe for so long. And, and weaving that with my conversations with Sharon and Prue, because I mean, we both, um, experienced uh, disrupted childhoods in terms of, you know, uh, mothering and nurturing. And so um, um, it was interesting that, you know, one of her earliest books I, I remembered when it came out and she was talking about as a child, I was always flying, you know, and really we were approaching it from the same point of view, you know, how, you know, when you're, when you're vulnerable and you're young, you don't have the vocabulary to, to, um, to speak and dissect and, and, and um, form language around your experience. You know, sometimes the alternative is to disappear. And so, um, yeah, that metaphor was very powerful in her early work. And so I was discovering how my pattern uh, was very similar. And so it was really interesting to um, uh, form poems around these experiences and to, and to interweave them and to discover, you know, how they, the, the theme, the theme was, was tying together. I, I never had such a long, arduous kind of um, um, gestation 
of, 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 of poems that, that I had to wait for them to speak to me properly um, about that dislocation, disembodiment, um, recovery of language, um, things, themes like that, you know, it was, is an amazing and yet slow and sometimes painful self-discovery, but, um, I think it was worth it, but yeah, it was always one day at a time. I'm still figuring things out in the manuscript. So, but thank you for asking. Yeah. Thank you. Helen, I'm going to combine a couple uh, questions out of the chat. Uh, one, uh, finally from David, and asking how the uh, how you feel the two parts of this book, Frost and Pollen, and and the section that you read uh, this evening, how they uh, relate to each other beyond the uh, surface plant con uh, connection, and uh, asking if you would be able to uh, if you would be willing to read one of the stances from Frost and Pollen. I'm gonna read first because I don't have a good answer to that question. Right. <laughs> um, Come now, frail now, travel case and lily. Send me my stomach bracket, snow and sprouting. If I forage, if I fold and fallen, if I should, I should or fumble. Tell me if my lip, my crisp, my zipper silk are swollen, you swell like dust, like pollen. Touch me, my sign, my omen. Your bloom and nightshade, my lovely rhododendron, my lovely silken rock. Your blush, my chrysanthemum. Your winter frost, dahlia and molten. My shoulder blades, raspberry and tarnish. Your breath, bloom and hemlock. Your, your frost, your flush, cold blossom, my mouth. Tell me fortunate, tell me columbine. I broke your course, you're selling. My venation, I venerate you. My whirl, my entire margin. Filigree in spring, my lilac, my not yet, you fly back. Your rougher tulip, bed still frozen. Choose my dear, choose in vestige, spreading open. I'm glad I read from it because it reminded me of one of the connections, which is that they're both, um, I think, so in the Green Knight, there's a lot of like Morgan and the Knight's relationship and then uh, like having a child, this idea of like death and fertility. And I think the, the same theme is really prevalent in Bloom and Martyr, like uh, sort of like fertility thing with plants, but also um, a fluff floating in front of my face. Also, uh, <laughs> you know, they're kind of creepy. When I when I used to describe the book, I'd be like, it's like sexy, creepy flower poems. So I think they both have that, <laughs> um, that kind of uh, interest as well. So, and I, I think maybe, you know, at, at times I've been like, do they fit really comfortably together? And I, I think like as a book, having those two things that are a bit different is kind of nice because Bloom and Martyr is like um, uh, more opaque in some ways, or maybe not opaque, but uh, like more intuitive and in feeling. So like it's more about texture, um, the texture of langu language. And then um, I think the, the Gawain poem or the Green Knight poem is more narrative. So it kind of gives you like a little bit of relief, I think after the, the kind of intensity of Bloom and Martyr, but it like has those same themes and images and things. So they kind of, uh, hopefully uh, it's like a fun reading experience to go through the whole book in that way. So. Editing this and, uh, with you being part of the process, I'm glad that you settled on a title other than Sexy Creepy Flower Poems. I think <laughs> you uh, were able to uh, clarify that. As we transition uh, back into our evenings, uh, once again, I would encourage you to use the link that Shelf Life has provided to uh, order uh, copies of our readers. But I'm also going to uh, kind of wrap up with, uh, with a question that uh, has been provided in the chat. And that's actually for each one of our uh, four readers. And that is, what comes next? How are you, how are you writing now? What, uh, what's next in the writing process? And how are we finding um, writing? You know, this is a, a strange time for all of us to be uh, writing both in community and in conversation and in isolation. How are we doing? Natalie, Ian, David, Helen. Well, I'm already unmuted, so I can go first. <laughs> I think, um, so I am working on a project now called Photographs from Nanton. The title might change, but uh, 
Uh, it's supported by the AFA. Thank you, AFA. Um, and I bought a collection of um, antique photos at one of the antique stores in Nanton. And I've always been really interested in these portraits of people that end up in like junk shops and antique stores. And it's like, how did this happen? Like, how did these people's photos end up here? And they're kind of um, like these people that have been forgotten somehow. And I'm interested in kind of working with those old photos to give them back some I don't know, warmth or care, I guess. So, you know, um, I don't know who they were. So it's it's kind of a hard thing to write about because I don't want to like put words in the mouths of these people. Uh, so the, the writing is more, I think about like photography, light and time and this sort of thing, but I'm making these like artistic frames for each of the photos that uh, they can fit into. So I don't have to wreck the photo to, uh, make the artwork. So I'm working on that. And then also I did a collaboration with my sister, Julia, with some Polaroid sheets up. And that one, that works kind of about like grief and uh, also a family trip to Tofino we did when we were kids. Uh, <laughs> so working on that. And then another one called, called Glass Clouds, but I'm thinking of changing it to vacancy rates and it's photos of everywhere downtown where the buildings reflect into each other and seem to make a like a, another, like a, an image of a building as though it's in another dimension. And because Calgary's so like bright and light and there are so many glass buildings, there's a lot of those neat spots. So I've been plugging away on that. But I think I find, um, I found writing during the pandemic was like, not that interrupted for me. I think it was a kind of a thing to take solace into and kind of find some flow and working it's something that I tend to do by myself I'm not a very like uh a person who shares a lot of drafts or anything like that so um I'm also introverted generally so <laughs> I think like staying home and writing alone was uh it's yeah I I mean I have to say too like actually having deadlines for Frost and Pollen probably helped with that um <laughs> as I say I'm like oh, I'm just so applied that I just worked the whole time but I think it's because you know um Derek would write to me and be like are you done yet with your draft yet <laughs> so yeah um but yeah thanks for asking and thanks everyone again for joining us we appreciate it Natalie uh Ian Wayman uh would any of you like to engage with that question as well yeah I can go um so I'm working on two projects one is a manuscript um it's been in the works for a few years. I'm a pretty slow writer, <laughs> slowly kind of poems sort of slowly coming together. But most of what I read tonight is from that manuscript. And um, usually I kind of write a bunch of stuff, then, you know, see if it'll hold together into a manuscript. I don't always have much of a plan, but I think there's some themes of like self and language and um, I don't know, femin femininity or sort of how to be being a woman in the world and defining yourself and all these kind of ideas that are vaguely coalescing in that manuscript. So, um, and then my other, oh, and one of the things I've been doing recently is kind of going through uh, my journal writing from the past year and a half or so, and kind of I have the process of writing in journals, then typing it up, then seeing what might be usable and then editing and on and on. So a lot of it is actually from the pandemic. And when the pandemic very first started, one of my th first thoughts was like, oh God, we're going to have to deal with so much artwork and movies and TV about the pandemic for the next like 20 years. And I was like, that's horrific. So I'm a little bit not sure if the writing I'm looking at now, um, because it is somewhat inflected and tinged by my experience of the pandemic, which is essentially sitting on this couch and <laughs> looking at this laptop, um, shows up in the writing. And I'm like, is this, is this interesting? Is this poetic? Or is this, you know, something that needs to just be left aside? So to me, it's a really interesting question. Like, can good art be made out of um, out of the pandemic and within it, um, hopefully. <laughs> and my other project is um, trying to sort of come up with some poetry related to um, the history of the um, very early French settlers of Canada. 
Um, and that, again, is a very kind of personal project, like I'm delving into my own heritage, but I have no real interest in sort of historical fiction or historical narratives. So I'm approaching it with some very conceptual um, techniques of building poetry and then also some more, um, I mean, more verging on the confessional, which again, is not my usual <laughs> style. So I'm not really sure. Um, about it, but it's interesting. So yeah, hopefully something will come out of that project too. So thank you for the question and thanks again for having me read. It's been a great evening. Thank you. Wayman, Ian, um, you are more than welcome to weigh in if you have some thoughts. Oh, um, I was just sending a text, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, I found the first probably year of COVID very disruptive, um, just to the routine, and and um, and somebody was saying, um, don't write zoo, uh, don't write um, COVID poems because it's too early to get a perspective on it, <laughs> and so um, and I, I didn't do I did actually write a few and then I hated them, <laughs> so it, it it I don't think I've I've still not really ready to write about it that well. Um, but as for the project, uh, I mean, I've been working on this manuscript and it's been all consuming this one that I, um, I just read some poems of. Um, but I've always had this interesting niggling side project of writing lots of poems about my cats. So um, yeah, I think eventually I'll probably in, in 15 years, I'll probably have enough poems to make a, a book of cat poems. Certainly, that takes a long perspective to get to know your cats over a bunch of decades and 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 um, see how they relate, see what they're telling you about your life, see what um, you know through their eyes, see what you've done wrong, see how you've traumatized them, you know, <laughs> things like that. So, but yeah. So we can look forward to a musical and eventually a movie uh, out of well, your cats. Hey, um, I'll, I'll I'll have to hire somebody to to do the the libretto because I'm I'm not musical at all. <laughs> I can't play an instrument to save my life. So anybody, any aspiring musician out there who might want to take it on, but who knows? <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Wayman. Ian? Uh, sure, How are things I'll going? Yeah, um, I'm actually mostly working on, on scholarly writing more than poetic writing uh, at the moment. So I'm uh, revising bits of my dissertation. Um, I've got an article on Jen Bourbon's Nets and Erasure Poetry, if anyone knows knows that. Um, and also another one on um, George Perex, uh, an attempt at an inventory of all the liquid and solid foodstuffs ingurgitated by me in the year 1974, um, which is uh, also wonderful. Uh, yeah, and then there's the Beowulf project, which is, um, I always work on that every day, a little bit, a couple lines, but it just is moving forward uh, a pace. And then another book, uh, I do have a, a book of sort of assorted translations and shorter poems and constraint-based works. Um, that I'm hoping hoping to finish soon. I think the pandemic, yeah, I don't know. It hasn't, um, uh, I, th I think the, the lack of a community or being able to like engage with people face-to-face -face has been a big part of it. I've realized like how crucial that was to my, to my writing practice and, you know, probably life in, in general. I think we've all felt that. Um, and I was also doing a lot of things before that um, you can only do in person sort of. I was in improv theater as well, and doing a lot of performances, which we continued online, but it is a different, um, a different medium to to improvise online. So, and uh, yeah, just a huge thanks to to Helen for inviting me to do this. The book is phenomenal, and I was it was a joy to be able to read with Aww. you tonight. Thanks. I was gonna say, after this, it's been so much fun. I should continue my like endless journey to pester you into doing some sort of collaborative work. So. <laughs> Watch out for the pestering. <laughs> and watch out for that project, uh, everyone. Um, please, uh, once again, check out that link. Please continue uh, to be safe and to take uh, the uh, health restrictions seriously and look out for each other and our communities. And remember that we're, as difficult as this time is, we are doing this for each other. We're doing this for our health and our safety and for those who are most vulnerable. If you are in Calgary, take a moment, head over to Shelf Life Books. Um, they are still, uh, you know, receiving customers face to face. You can check these books out in person. 
uh, now that you've heard a, um, a, a sonic sample. And um, the staff there will, of course, be more than willing to help you. Uh, thank you again for an excellent evening. Uh, thank you, Natalie, Ian, Wayman. Congratulations, Helen. And um, I hope everyone uh, stays safe, has a wonderful evening, enjoys the book. I'm seeing a few, uh, few people holding them up already. Uh, you know, it's selling. Congratulations again. And everyone, have a great evening, and we'll see you all very soon. We'll sign out here from Banff. Have a great time.